Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation on leveraging design thinking to evaluate and enhance online discussion activities, specifically in the context of graduate health professional learners. My name is Mohammed Hassan Nasser and I'm a program assistant with the Health Science Education Graduate Program or HSED program here at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. In addition to the staff role, I'm also in my final year of the Honors Bachelor's of Health Sciences program at McMaster University and I'm looking forward to graduating in April 2021. When I'm not supporting the HSCD program or cramming for midterm, you'll probably find me hanging out with friends or exploring the local food scene. I'd also like to highlight my faculty mentor and supervisor on this project, Dr. Alana Bayer, who is an assistant professor as well as a director of the Learning Technologies Lab in the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster. Before we start, let's briefly go over what we'll be covering in our presentation today. We'll start off with a brief introduction to design thinking just to give you some context followed by a case study style exploration of our experience using design thinking to co-create re-envisioned online discussion activities in the HSED program. We'll share some insights around graduate health professional learners' needs during the pandemic era online learning, um, which we found during our work. And then the last segment of this presentation will focus on various user engagement and data collection strategies that can be leveraged for design-based online pedagogical development. We'll also touch on some practical steps you can use to leverage design thinking in your own educational context. So with that, let's get into it. So you've heard me mention design thinking and you're probably wondering what that is. Design thinking refers to a human-centered problem-solving approach that places end users at the center of the design process and fosters shared decision-making to create meaningful solutions to established or emerging challenges. Design thinking can be broken down into five main stages. The empathize stage, which entails using an empathetic and non-judgmental consideration of stakeholders' perspectives and experiences to understand their genuine challenges and opportunities in the educational context. In the defined stage, stakeholders' ex experiences and input are used to identify and frame the most pertinent and meaningful challenges and opportunities. The idea stage then involves working with stakeholders to generate innovative ideas and approaches to address the challenges identified in previous stages. In the prototype stage, these data and ideas generated are developed into cohesive prototypes, which in the test stage are piloted with stakeholders who generate feedback and performance data, and that informs the further redesign, refinement, and optimization of these prototypes. You might have noticed that I avoided numbering the steps as 1, 2, 3, and so on. This is because the iterative nature of these stages is central to design thinking. Often robust applications of the design thinking approach require cycling through these phases numerous times. This iterative cycling um, allows for continuing, continual refinement of each of these stages by acknowledging and embracing the interconnectedness of stakeholders' experiences with the solutions de designed to enhance them. But why go through all this effort when you could just call an educational expert to develop a solution for you? Well, the literature has shown that design thinking um, in a variety of settings, including higher education, can yield solutions that are more effective, easier to use, and accepted compared to traditional expert-based solutions. Additionally, the design thinking approach values each user's independent voice, fostering a sense of conclusion, empowerment, um, and investment in problem solving and co-constructing solutions. So let's see how we apply these stages of design thinking in our context and the experiences and insights we had. Um, before we get too deep into that, however, um, it might be beneficial to give some background on the Health Science Education or the HSCD program at McMaster where this design thinking project was carried out. So HACD is a master's level degree program at McMaster University whose students are generally early to mid-career health professionals um, and the program equips these students with the theoretical and practical tools to successfully teach the next generation of health professionals. However, the program is unique in that it is a totally online and majority asynchronous program. This means that educational activities take place virtually um, when and where the student decides to engage them. This allows our students an enhanced level of autonomy um, in how they pursue their master's degree, and this makes our program particularly attractive for working health professionals, especially during COVID-19. 
Our work in using design thinking um, in our program was to understand the needs of learners and instructors and to enhance their educational experience. We'll also be touching on online discussions as a focus of our design thinking intervention later in the presentation. Um, so it's important to note here that all courses in the HSED program involve um, asynchronous online discussion components that learners engage with and are included as part of their assessment for each course. So we began with the empathy stage and in alignment with the principles of design thinking, we wanted to establish what areas presented challenges and opportunities for stakeholders in our program. Um, and we wanted to obtain this directly from stakeholders themselves. So to do so, we conducted um, a program retreat with focus groups to generate empathy maps. And empathy maps allow us to visualize what stakeholders say, think, feel, and do. And by mapping the experiences of participants, we constructed themes around stakeholders' needs in the program. Using these themes, we generated interview questions that were used in subsequent semi-structured interviews with learners, faculty, and staff in the program to get a more refined and granular sense of stakeholders' experiences and needs. Initially, interviews were conducted um, with learners in an in-person setting. However, we switched to teleconferencing platforms um, as public health restrictions due to the pandemic set in. And after conducting these interviews, we coded and qualitatively analyzed all the data to elucidate themes around individuals' experiences with the program. We then moved on to the define stage. And the central goal of this stage was to identify the challenges and opportunities users, in this case specifically learners, face in our program. Based on the data from the previous stage, we saw online discussion activities as an area of the program raised by many of our learners. Um, in the Define stage, it was important that we really fleshed out the challenges and opportunities by elucidating their underlying factors. Let me use an example here um, to explain what I mean by underlying factors. For instance, we saw that learners mentioned struggling to keep up with asynchronous online discussion. But why was that actually occurring? Did they perceive the discussions to be unhelpful to their learning and therefore lose interest? or were discussions expanding with a pace that was simply too hard to keep up with. To explore these underlying factors, we held focus groups with learners and we asked them to frame their challenges and opportunities as how might we statements. Extending this to the earlier example I gave, how might we questions might sound like how might we make online discussion more relevant to our learning or how might we make online discussions more manageable to monitor. We also provide participants with synthesized data around online discussions from the empathy stage, which we'll share with you later on. Um, and this was essentially just to provide them with a starting point and also points again to that iterative, na iterative nature of the design thinking process that I spoke about earlier um, around how we added new challenges while also elucidating and flushing out previously identified ones. In the ID stage, we asked participants in our focus groups to brainstorm potential approaches to tackling these challenges and opportunities. Essentially, we asked them to answer their own how might we questions. At first, we asked learners to engage their ideas with a focus, uh, focus for quantity over quality um, and not to judge the potential consequences or practicality of their initial ideas. And after collecting many ideas, we then prompted learners to consider the feasibility and impact of each idea they generated and to create a hierarchy um, of approaches they would like to see implemented in the program. We cycled three focus groups with a total of seven participants through the define and IDA stages to generate a rich data set and again to reflect that iterative nature of design thinking. Then, based on the data, we synthesized our findings um, and we constructed a prototype to re-envision online discussion in our program. The prototype reflected more than simply features of an online discussion that we would like to see and included considerations around assessment, inclusion and belonging, community and cultural relevancy that were constructed from the data. Then, based on the data, we synthesized our findings um, and constructed a prototype to re-envision online discussion in our program. The prototype reflected more than simply features of an online discussion we would have liked to see, but also included considerations around assessment, inclusion and belonging, community and cultural relevancy that were constructed from the data. In our ongoing work, um, which we'll touch on later in the presentation, we are engaging with the test stage to pilot this prototype and collect data on if and how learner experiences change, why they change, and how this can contribute to the further refinement of our innovation. 
Once again, this points to the importance of revisiting and re-engaging with earlier stages throughout the design thinking process. So now that you have an idea of how we leveraged um, design thinking in the context of our program, I'd like to very briefly explore our findings and some insights we uncovered throughout this process. When we filtered through our data from the empathy stage with a specific focus on online discussions, we constructed four major themes around connection and community, workload, learner autonomy, and academic and professional relevance. We visualize this data in the form of a four-circle Venn diagram, which you can just see here, um, with the center, which has overlap from all three or all four themes, um, representing the holistic learner experience. As I mentioned, these data were provided to our participants during our Define and Ideate focus groups that we previously discussed, and this will just again help them inform their brainstorming process. In the Define stage, learners framed their priority challenges and approaches in three questions. The first one entailed, how might we create a discussion-based community of learning? The second was around, how might we give learners more freedom and facilitate greater authenticity and investment in discussion? And finally, how might we create a discussion-based community of learning that is both authentic and flexible? As you can see, community, autonomy, and authenticity emerged as major challenges and opportunities for learners when it came to online discussion activities. It's also important to note that authenticity in this context referred to two underlying concepts. Authenticity in the substance of a discussion, which involved what the discussion was about, um, including the relevance of content to the learner's professional and academic activities. The second aspect of authenticity concerned the modality of discussion, which entailed ensuring um, engagement with the discussion was done in an organic way. And this concept is also reflected in the idea of flexibility, as discussion options should be easily accessible for learners, um, allowing them to engage with um, discussion or online discussion in a manner that is authentic to their professional and personal workflows. In the IDA stage, learners generated um, four categories of ideas to address the how might we statements they created in the previous stage. The first one surrounded validation strategies, which included liking and reacting to discussion posts, for example. And the next was around a diversity of posting options, both in terms of the content, um, in other words, the structure and substance of the posts, um, as well as the format. So that could be text-based, video-based, or audio-based, as well as the modality, um, so accessing discussion platforms through a laptop, smartphone, um, tablet, or other internet-connected device. Learners also mentioned synchronous discussion options, which tied back into the themes of authenticity and community. Finally, they also touched on reframing assessment to recenter dialogue in the evaluation of discussion. Now, let's take a high-level look at the prototype we developed. In our program, we use an institutionally supported learning management system known as Avni to Learn, which is based on Brightspace, to administer asynchronous online discussion. However, based on the data we collected, we generated a prototype that based online discussion in Microsoft Teams. The prototype itself is more than simply using Microsoft Teams, and it's actually composed of three components. Um, the first being design principles, and these are considerations that emerge from the data um, that we kept in mind when developing the prototype itself. The second component of the prototype is what we call the prototype proper, um, and this is essentially the functional aspect of the prototype. Um, and we'll take a very brief look at the main features associated with online discussion in Microsoft Teams that were captured in the prototype proper. The first feature is the ability to have multiple channels, each with its own dis distinct scope and purpose. This feature reflects the learner's ideas around increasing the, the diversity of content explored in online discussion activities. Teams also allows for reactions to posts and comments through a limited set of emojis, and this ties back into the ideas of validation previously mentioned. Additionally, it has integrated video conferencing capacities, allowing for users to plan meetings or even meet spontaneously, again reflecting the option for synchronous discussion identified by learners in the ID8 phase. Teams also allows for much more versatility through a mobile app, video and audio posting options, tagging other users in posts and comments, and personalizing posts through various strategies such as hyperlinks, file attachments, and customizing the size, color, styling, and structure of text. And this ties back into both the ideas of diverse options in the modality of posting, 
the content of posting, as well as the ease of access to online discussion activities through various internet-connected devices. It's also worth pointing out that Teams can be directly integrated with Avenue to Learn, our institutionally supported learning management system, and this can be done through um, widgets that instructors can place on their course homepage that directly adds and directs learners into the specific course space on Microsoft Teams. And this can help mitigate the concerns around technological barriers um, in our design principles. Overall, these features seek to address the identified challenges and opportunities learners face in online discussion. Finally, the third component was around guiding practices, and these are a set of practices that we hope will guide the successful implementation of this prototype. So our guiding principles contain considerations around cultural relevancy and teaching and learning norms among a diverse group of students. And the second guiding practice was around assessment um, and what that might look like in Avenue to Learn versus Teams. And again, shifting to a dialogue-centric framing of assessment. So now that we've briefly looked into what we found throughout our journey in design thinking so far, um, you may be left wondering why any of these findings are particularly relevant or even significant. So many of the findings um, we had reflect prevalent themes in literature around community, connection, and academic and professional relevancy in online pedagogy. Additionally, many of the features generated, including validation and dialogue-centric assessment, are aligned with major theories of learning such as constructivism. However, we believe our findings are unique and particularly so for two main reasons. Firstly, these findings reflect the need of health professional learners who are perhaps one of the most uniquely impacted learners during the pandemic, often balancing both an online education and unprecedented challenges in the healthcare workplace. These findings also reflect the needs of, for the large part, experienced online learners. And what I mean by experienced online learners is that many of the participants in our program had been engaging with online education before the pandemic. Um, so these findings reflect a unique set of learners um, who engage with virtual education before, throughout, and hopefully now past the pandemic. So now that you have a fuller picture of our experiences and findings with design thinking, let's explore how you can use intentional design-based approaches like design thinking in your own educational context. So it starts with an understanding of the experiences of stakeholders without making presumptions based on anecdotal evidence or our own personal experiences as past, or in my case, present learners, um, or as staff and instructors. From a practical level, evaluating the challenges and opportunities stakeholders face typically involves using focus groups, surveys, interviews, and other qualitative methods to elucidate the experiences of learners, instructors, and staff. Now common video conferencing platforms such as Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, and more can make interviews and focus groups more accessible and easier on educators by facilitating re recordings and transcribe transcribing, um, which is important for qualitative analysis down the road. The next step is crucial, um, and this involves engaging users, and whether that's instructors, learners, or staff, um, having them involved in defining challenges and opportunities they prioritize um, can help us elucidate genuine needs. And here's where things kind of get fun. In our work, we used a blend of Zoom and Google Jamboard to collect and synthesize ideas during focus groups, and this allowed us to collect a very rich data set. So not only did we have recordings of our synchronous discussions in the call, we also had the data that participants generated on the Google Jamboard through sticky notes, drawings, and even simply the relative placement of text on the Jamboard. Jamboards also allowed a degree of anonymity in sharing thoughts and ideas, as well as just creating more opportunity for rich data collection. However, I will say that the amount of data generated through the combination of these methodologies can make qualitative data analysis more time intensive and complex, um, and it also requires greater qualitative skill development. Overall, using design thinking creates the opportunity to co-develop pedagogical innovations with stakeholders um, in a manner that makes our learners and instructors invested members of our communities of learning. They allow us to co-create our educational environments, fostering spaces where the individual perspectives of all stakeholders are seen, validated, and valued. So now that you know how to use design thinking, um, are you ready to do it in your own educational context?
We encourage you to take that first step and see where your design journey takes you. Thank you for listening to this presentation.